All right. Now we can get going. Thanks, Michelle. All right. No problem. Um, So this is uh, an interesting topic because time is something we all are aware of that we never have enough of. And we always go, gee, I wish I had time to do fill in the blank. Well, we've used the sun, the moon, the stars to be able to measure time, define the passage of time. We've developed ways to standardize time, to come up with calendars, um, to be able to uh, uh, mark the passage of time in, in various ways with various means and structures. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, how we've developed calendars and ways we've divided and measured time. Now, each particular segment of this talk could be its own talk. I, I, I could I could talk for hours and hours, ha ha, for time, um, about time, but um, I won't do that. Uh, but I hope this at least gives you some uh, food for thought next time you wonder about, say, daylight, daylight saving time or, um, or how uh, we get the calendar that we use every single day. Um, or when you look at the clock and you go, why is a second as long as it is? Why is an hour, why do we have 24 hours in one day? That sort of stuff. And I know that if there are any questions that I don't answer, that um, I am positive that the reference desk at the library can help you out with, uh, with answers to your questions. And as always, if you have questions, I would love to see your questions. Please throw them into the chat or the Q&A. It doesn't matter to me where they go. I'll find them either way. Um, if you hear a little meowing in the background, it's just a cat that is uh, deciding to run around the house during my talk. So, you know, as cats do. Um, so why don't we get started? I'll get to the questions at the end, but throw them in the chat or the Q&A at any point. So let me share my screen. Give me just a second. All right. Okay, first thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit about calendars. How do we, how did we get the calendar that we use um, it, these days? Well, the oldest calendars for measuring time are based on the moon. It seems logical to us that maybe people would have used the sun a long time ago, but the bones of ancient animals dating over 20,000 years old appear like this one to have carvings uh, recording the phases of the moon. Now I'm gonna show you a drawing based on this carving in my next image. So if you don't see phases of the moon in here, don't worry, I'm gonna show you something that'll, that'll make it a little bit more clear. Um, but hunters tracking game needed to know how long they had been gone from their camp. This made the moon the obvious choice to track the passage of time as the differences in moon phases are easily visible from one day to the next, provided it's clear out. <laughs> but changes in the sun's position or height in the sky from one day the, to the next, it's, it's almost in, indistinguishable. The moon's differences are much more readily visible. Now here is the drawing based on that that, uh, that bone carving that I just showed you. The phases of the moon depicted in these marks are kind of inexact. Uh, the reason for that is, unless it was clear out every single day and night, um, you couldn't get an exact representation of uh, phases of the moon. That would have been unrealistic. But what you're seeing here are, are different carvings. And if you take a look at the shapes of each of the carvings, I think you can see my cursor, but take a look at the at each one. You can see that there are curves. Uh, some of the drawings are a little bit bigger, some a little bit smaller. You've got crescents and curves on one side, crescents and curves on the other side. This implies these people were using math to count. These people were using the moon for their calendar. These people were using the moon and this calendar to look into the future, not just counting time as it existed right this very second. Meaning, let's say they wanted to track game for a certain period of time. Well, you could look in the sky and see what the phase of the moon might be. Now, you could count forward using this particular uh, uh, bone drawing or bone carving to be able to look into the future and say, okay, 
when I see the moon looking like this in the sky, that's how we know we will have been gone a certain number of days. That way you kind of don't even have to count the number of days. You can just compare what you see in the sky to what you see on this carving. Now you might have not have noticed there are actually notches on the edges. I'll go back to the original one. Now, if you look at them, you can probably see them much more readily. Um, there are notches on the top and, and, and bottom of, um, of this bone. Now, this provides a simple coordinate system used to put the images in the right spots on this antler bone. Um, now, the, uh, the four cavities that were over here on the left-hand side, uh, believe it or not, those we think are a mistake. Um, so we've got notches or, or uh, lines that are etched into either end of where you've got these different moon phases. And we think basically that was so you could delineate, pay attention to these drawings. Oops, I made a mistake with these other ones over here. Don't pay attention to those. So anyway, um, uh, it's, it's really neat to be able to see this. Now, are we absolutely certain that that's what this bone was used for? No. Um, there's no way to know for certain because it's not like people were writing down and I used the moon to create this carving. Um, but it seems like a plausible uh, idea. Now, many ancient cultures started the month when the thin crescent moon could be seen just after sunset. Now, these days in astronomy, we call the phase new moon to, it means the phase of the moon when the moon is in the same part of the sky as the sun and you can't see it. When the moon has moved a little bit farther in its orbit around the earth and it's moved away from the bright glare of the sun, it might take a day or two or three after the uh, after what we currently call new moon to be able to see the crescent moon. Um, but in many cultures, this type of moon is the, cre is the new moon. Um, so the moon that is new, the one that starts the phases for the month. By the way, the word month comes from the word moon. It's a moon. So, and it's approximately the number of days it takes for the moon to go around the earth once. It's not exactly, um, but uh, it takes the moon 29 and a half earth days to go around the earth once. And so our months, our moons are 28, 29, 30, or 31 days. Now, the phases of the moon provide a convenient way of creating 29 or 30 day blocks of time. Um, and this transforms this knowledge into a means of predicting future events. But this isn't all straightforward. The reason we've got many different lengths of, of the time period we call a month, the reason we have different lengths is because our current calendar is based on the sun and the cycle of moon phases does not equal the cycle uh, that it takes um, uh, for the earth to go around the sun once. So you don't fit an even number or a, or a, or a full number of uh, cycles of moon phases into the one cycle of the year based on the sun. Instead, the moon tends to undergo between 12 and 13 cycles in any given solar year. So in order to keep your moon cycles in line with your sun cycles, you might need some kind of a reset button so you know when to start counting again. Now, this may sound complicated, but um, uh, let me give you an example of a possible reset that a culture had created in order to start over in terms of counting your moon phases with your sun cycle. Now, here's an example of a site that appears to have this built-in reset. This is a view from the air of a portion of Aberdeenshire, Scotland. And a drought in 1976 um, showed a really dry ground. And in that dry ground, several circles had become visible um, in the ground. And we think this is a series of pits that were dug into the ground. This is called the Warren Field. Um, and it may be an example of a pit calendar. So here we've got people standing where some of these pits had been excavated and some of them had yet to have been excavated when this picture was taken. But this shows the scale of this site. And you've got um, all these pits and they're separated by a certain distance. In all, 
um, the entire length of these pits, again, these are excavated and there are others that are there. We can tell they're there, uh, but they just ha hadn't been excavated yet when this picture was taken. The entire length of this site is about 150 feet long. Two of the pits still held evidence of a post of some sort that was in the pit, while others of the pits showed evidence of material that was deliberately placed there, including stones. And you go, well, how do you know the stones were deliberately placed there? Were, could they have just fallen into the pit? Well, yeah, except the, some of these are stones that aren't from this particular location. They came from a, a long distance away. Now, there were 12 pits. And they were carefully cut so that the smallest two lie at either end of the pit alignment. From the two at the ends, the holes become larger until they reach pit five near the middle. And then so you've got small pit at the end, bigger, bigger, bigger till you get to pit five in the middle. That's the biggest one. And then smaller, smaller, smaller out to the other end. Now, pit five is about six feet across, about four feet deep. And it has a misaligned neighbor, pit six. So this one's uh, pit five right here. Here's pit six. And um, this, this whole series of pits is in a gently curving arc. But again, one of them appears to be a little misaligned with the rest. Anyone watching from the Warren Field area in the year 8,000 BC, 10,000 years ago, would have seen the midwinter solstice sunrise. So what we would call the winter solstice, that sunrise occurring in the notch on the horizon. Now, by creating a fixed point on the horizon where you could start your annual, annual solar event, it becomes possible to prevent the lunar calendar from getting cast adrift of the seasons. Basically, if you just stick to your lunar calendar, over time, your lunar calendar is going to be completely out of whack from your solar calendar. Um, and so when, if you have this reset, then you can start counting off the lunar months until the next midwinter solstice when you start counting again. So again, it's easiest to base your daily life on the moon, but you can reset your lunar calendar every year based on the sun. And once you've mastered all this, you basically just have to track your lunar months in order to make your functional calendar for the year. Um, and the slight misalignment of pit six might be explained by being the point of observation toward that, that winter solstice um, sunrise location. Now, it doesn't mean that solar observations weren't important. They were. And just because the moon was an easier timekeeping device didn't mean that the sun wasn't watched too. This is the oldest known solar observatory on Earth. It's called the Gorsuch Circle, and it's from approximately 7,000 years ago. Um, and in this case, um, we have a location which you can call an observatory. It meant a place that observations are done of the sky. You could use them for specific purposes, such as aligning your calendar, the timing of rituals, and all sorts of things. Now, how do we know that this is aligned to the sun? Well, if you stand in the middle of this circle, in the in the very middle of it, um, it's aligned to the mid-winter solstice and sunrise if you're standing in the middle, or it's aligned to the summer solstice, sunrise, and sunset if you're standing on the outside looking in. Now, alignments and the timing of these were very important. If you had your calendar running properly based on these alignments and observations, presumably everything else in your life and in your community would hopefully run properly too. Now, this is a, a monument which, um, now I'll go back to the picture, the, the, the wooden posts, those are new. Those have not been standing for 7,000 years. Um, but the site itself is is original. But some of these monuments could grow to monumental size. And here's an example of that. Um, this is Newgrange in Ireland. It was built about 5,000 years ago. So, so about 7,000, sorry, sorry, about 5,000 years ago, about 3,000 BC ish. Um, and this picture doesn't exactly give you a sense of the scale of this site. Here is the sense of the scale of this site. This is a large mound that covers over an acre of space. Um, here are stairs right here, just to give you a sense. And this is a walking path right here. It's almost amazing and unimaginable to think how 
big this thing is. The amount of time and labor invested in arranging this and constructing Newgrange suggests this was a very well-organized society that had specialized groups responsible for different aspects of this construction over a long period of time. You can't just say, all right, everybody, we're going to just construct this thing right here. Well, you still need people to plow the fields and, and farm the animals and all that kind of stuff and keep your society going while all this was going on also. Um, so this was an amazing accomplishment for 5,000 years ago. Now, there are some stones near the front passageway, and some of these are engraved. And so the, the most striking is this entrance stone with these curly cues and swirls and other designs that are on them. But what's most amazing is the interior of the Newgrange Mound. There is a 19 meter long passage, so it's about 60-ish feet long. Um, that leads to a cross-shaped chamber. So this image down here at the bottom, this drawing at the bottom is top-down view. This image near the top is a side view. And so you would go in and walk down this corridor and there'd be a corbelled roof down or over uh, at the far end. What would happen is on the winter solstice sunrise, the sun rises and a few minutes after sunrise, the, the light shines down the passageway and illuminates the back end of the passageway, that 60-ish foot long chamber. There are drawings there at the back end. Um, and so this is something that still works today. And I don't know if Newgrange is still doing this, but at least in the before times, you could get into a lottery to be able to go see this winter solstice sunrise effect with the light shining on these drawings at the or these carvings at the back of the of the passageway um, and it works for a few days in and around uh, the solstice the winter solstice so it isn't just exactly on the winter solstice there's a little bit of leeway um, in terms of the exact placement of where the sun is when you can see this effect and I've heard it's really amazing to be able to see this because it's only visible um, for uh, a, a short while before the sun rises too high and then the effect is gone. Well, we've got something kind of similar to this in the desert southwest United States. Now, this is an 800 year old stone slab monument at this place right here called Fajada Butte um, at Chaco Canyon. And so we're gonna go in toward where the, um, uh, where the stone slab monument is. This is just showing you the wide angle view here. There are slabs that were likely um, utilized by the ancient Anasazi people. Uh, and probably used for ceremonial purposes. And they use these stone slabs as a calendar feature. So let me show you those stone slabs. Those are, those are the slabs right here. The slabs rest almost vertically against the smooth cliff face and they fan out to the south. And they form the side walls and roof of an elongated triangular niche. So here's the, here's the niche right here. So here are the slabs. Here's the triangular niche. And they just kind of sit against here. The direction that you're facing in this picture it would be north-ish. And the direction the slab ends are facing toward you are facing south. Um, and so the cliff wall, the, the light shines past the slabs and shines through the cracks in the slabs onto the cliff wall beyond. And so at the summer solstice before midday, there are shafts of light that illuminate the cliff face. And the shaft here um, illuminates in this, in this case, it's a, it's a circular spiral um, carving that uh, the shaft will uh, illuminate the middle of. And so the, it's called the sun dagger. And this dagger appears and continues growing and moving downward until it cleanly bisects the spiral over its entire height. Now, this does not happen exactly at local noon, um, but it happens close to noon. And at this point, the sun is high enough in the sky for the overhang above this site to start casting a shadow on the slabs. And in doing so, this will eventually cut off the view of, of or cut off the, the sunlight. So this whole event from light appears, sun dagger appears, and then the sun dagger disappears lasts about 20 minutes. At the equinoxes, a line appears to the right of the center of the spiral. Um, on the winter solstice, 
two daggers appear to either side of the spiral. So this is showing you the winter solstice view. So the summer solstice, sun dagger through the middle. Equinox, sun dagger to the right of the center. Winter solstice, two daggers to either side. This shows you these people were watching this site over and over and over to be able to learn what the pattern was and then be able to make a carving in the wall that was able to utilize this as a calendar. Um, there also appear to be periodic alignments with the moonrise. So the moon is definitely bright enough at times to be able to illuminate this pattern as well. And when the moon reaches its highest and lowest points in the sky, uh, this cycle extends for 18.6 years. Think about the amount of observation that was needed to be able to pick out that pattern. And so utilizing these calendars for characterizing lunar and solar observing for the purpose of determining your calendar was definitely important to people all over the world. And I could do an entire talk just on this sort of stuff, but we are going to move on because we're going to talk about calendars some more. So these were calendars that were in use um, over hundreds, if not thousands of years. By the time of Julius Caesar, this is a bust potentially showing Julius Caesar, um, the lunar calendar uh, that was in use by the Romans had become so out of sync with the seasons that Julius Caesar employed Sosigenes of, of Alexandria, which, who was Cleopatra's court astronomer, to fix the problem. At his suggestion, they threw out the old lunar calendar and replaced it with one that only used the sun to mark the year. Now, this calendar employed leap years. If you're wondering why we have leap years, well, you can thank uh, Sosigenes and Julius Caesar. Um, with every year being 365 days long, and they added one extra day every four years. So uh, it was not necessarily February 29th. Um, that's not quite how the Roman calendar worked. It actually came out to like February 25th um, is when that extra day was added, but whatever. Um, they, they definitely started adding a leap day to uh, every four years. However, this wasn't a perfect fix. The last fraction of a day in a year. So it takes 365 and a quarter days for the Earth to go around the sun. However, it's actually slightly less than a quarter of a day. The problem is they didn't know that or they didn't have the amount of um, observational precision to see that the time it took the Earth to go around the sun was not 365 and a quarter. It was just slightly under 365 and a quarter days. So this was um, approximately the year 44 B.C. By the time the 1500s had rolled around, this Julian calendar was out of step with the seasons. The Julian leap year formula had overcompensated for the actual length of a year. It added one too many days to the calendar every 128 years. So that little tiny error in that quarter of a day added up to one too many day leap days being added every 128 years. What this means is that the equinox would occur on March 20th, and 128 years later, the equinox would have been on March 19th, and 128 years later, it's on March 18th, and so on, and so on. And by 1582, the seasons were occurring about 10 days earlier on the calendar than when the calendar was originally constructed. So according to the calendar, the equinox should have been March 20th, if you had your calendar lined up just right. But that wasn't when the equinox was actually occurring. It was occurring about 10 days earlier. Some church holidays in the 1500s were getting really out of whack from when they were expected to happen, especially Easter. And as we all know, you don't mess with Easter and when that's supposed to occur. So something had to be done to fix this. In 1582, Pope Gregory XIII authorized the new style calendar or the Gregorian calendar. To get the calendar aligned properly with the seasons, 10 days were lopped off from the month of October 1582. So in Catholic countries that adopted the new calendar, the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi was on Thursday, October 4th, 1582. And this was directly followed by Friday, October 15th. So 10 days of the calendar were lopped off. This date was the only thing affected, not the cycle of weekdays. So Thursday went to Friday. It just went from October 4th to October 15th. 
Now, this new calendar system dictated that leap years be skipped on years divisible by 100, except when divisible by 400. So while the year 1900 was not a leap year, the year 2000 was. And it will be thousands of years before we have to fix the very, very, very slight differences but that even this um, uh, puts into there just because 365 and just slightly under a quarter days long isn't quite right close enough. Today, we still use the modified calendar of Sosigenes. However, not everyone was pleased with the Pope's efforts. Protestant countries, including England and its colonies, yes, including the colonies here at the time, did not recognize the authority of the Pope. And so they continued to use the Julian calendar past 1582, all the way to 1752. Now, what am I showing you here on this image? This uh, is a map showing the path of a solar eclipse. We were talking about solar eclipses earlier. This was a solar eclipse that was occurring in the year 1748. And you can see the pictures on the outside where the drawings were showing you what the eclipse would look like. And those are in different cities of Gibraltar, Madeira, uh, Quebec, um, Cairo, Jerusalem, Moscow, uh, various others. And what might be kind of hard to see, especially if you're seeing this on a small screen, is here's the, the path of totality for the, for the solar eclipse, and here's where the eclipse was visible just in general. Great, except for one thing. The date of the eclipse on this map is July 14th, 17, sorry, 1748, 1748. But if you look in major eclipse archives, so, such as from the U.S. Naval Observatory or NASA, there was no eclipse on July 14th, 1748. It was on July 25th. The date on this particular map is a Julian calendar date, which was still being used by England. So July 14th, 1748 on this map in the Julian system was July 25th, 1748 in the Gregorian system. The Gregorian calendar is still widely used around the world today. Finally, uh, England et al. came in line um, in uh, 1752. And actually, the the Julian calendar was still being used uh, till Soviet till the Soviet Union times in, I believe, 1918. Um, so there you go. That's it was a little bit confusing when I first saw this map. I'm like, oh, July 14th, 1748. Wait a minute, there was no eclipse July 14th. This because of the calendar that was in use. All right, so we've got calendars that were finally starting to be standardized in 1752. How about time? How about our clocks? We use standard measurements of time. How did we get there? Well, our 24-hour day comes from the ancient Egyptians who divided daytime into 10 hours that they measured with devices such as shadow clocks like this one. You might call it a sundial. Um, and they added a twilight hour at the beginning and another one at the end of the daytime for 12 daylight hours total. Nighttime was divided into 12 hours also. And this was all based on the observations of, of the stars. Um, amazingly, these this calendar system of these day and night cycles, there were tables of these that were created. They even carved them into Egyptian coffin lids, presumably so that the dead could tell time as well. But in the Egyptian system, the length of the daytime and nighttime hours were not equal, and they varied with the seasons. In summertime, the daytime hours were longer than the nighttime hours, while in winter, the nighttime hours were longer than the daytime hours. So there were 24 hours total. They just weren't standard length hours. This unequal way of distributing the hours was used by a number of different people for hundreds and hundreds of years. The Egyptian month was organized into three weeks of 10 days each. And the start of the lunar month was marked by the disappearance of the waning moon. Now here's another example of a sundial. Um, we've got a large one here and a small one over here. Um, this is at the Fatih Mosque in Istanbul. And this is dating back to the late 16th century. So the late 1500s, it's on the Southwest facade of the building. Sundials typically used an object such as a stick, a string, or something else to cast a shadow onto a dial. And as the sun moved across the sky, the shadow moved on the dial, and you could read the time on the dial. That's one way of telling time. So we had these unequal hour lengths used by a lot of people. We've got 
ways to measure time using the sun. We've got ways to also measure time that didn't have to use the sun, because as we all know, it's not always sunny. So over the millennia, people and cultures around the world developed some pretty ingenious and quite simple methods for tracking blocks of time. Besides sundials, early timekeepers included water clocks. So the time it took for the water to flow outward from the vessel denoted the passage of a block of time. So you would fill a bowl or a container up to a standard height, and then the hole that was in that particular bowl or vessel would allow water to drain out. And by the time the water was drained out, a particular amount of time had passed, whatever that amount of, um, amount of time was. Um, Egyptians accurately marked the passage of time at night using water clocks like these. And this is a display of two outflow water clocks from the ancient Agora Museum in Athens. The top one is the original. The one at the bottom on the left is the copy, um, but the one at the top is an original water clock. Um, the one on the right is a Persian uh, water clock. So, but these water clocks were used in China and Japan, Persia, uh, Greece, all over the place. But the concept of fixed length hours, however, did not originate until the Hellenistic period, the Greek period, when the Greek astronomers began using such a system for their mathematical calculations. The Greek astronomer Hipparchus, uh, who's somewhat shown here, don't know if he actually looked like this, but his work primarily took place between 147 and 127 BC. He proposed dividing the day into 24 equal length hours based on 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness observed on equinox days. So basically, hey, you've got equal amounts of day and night on the equinoxes. Let's base our, our time on that. But it would be several hundred years more before these standard length hours would be used by everyday people. And around the year 1000, mechanical devices that rang bells to tell time began to appear in Western Europe. Something, the word clock comes from the French word for bell. And these early mechanisms had, had no dials, just bells. Uh, you didn't need to see the time, you just needed to hear it. Um, so as long as you were within earshot of the bells, you could tell what time it was. So within a few hundred years, dials were added to visually show the hour. And by the 1200s, astronomer monks were creating movements with the dials that had an hour hand and displayed moon phases, solstices, equinoxes, and more. This is the uh, astronomical clock that's in the city of Prague. Um, so you can go see this today. But note there are hour hands, no minute hands or second hands. These weren't divisions of time that were easily tracked or even needed. No one needed to know time that precisely. So the hours were plenty for people to know. In the Middle Ages, knowing the hour was enough for everyday activity. The word moment, we think of it today as being used as representing the blink of an eye but it originally meant the passage of a quarter of an hour. And as astronomy advanced, even more precision was needed. Clock displays started to divide the hour into halves, thirds, quarters, and sometimes even 12 parts, but not yet by 60. In fact, the hour was not commonly understood to be the duration of 60 minutes. It was not practical for the general public to consider minutes until the first mechanical clocks that displayed minutes and later seconds appeared near the end of the 1500s. This advancement in time measurement came from swinging pendulums. Galileo studied pendulums at the beginning of the 1600s, and in 1644, um, there was a French mathematician who used a pendulum to define what a second was. Something we think we know so well. Someone had to sit down and go, I declare a second to be this amount of time. In 1657, Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens applied for a patent which used the regular swinging of a pendulum to regulate the passage of time. Clocks were now accurate enough to justify an hour hand, a minute hand, and a second hand. Once we had the mechanical ability to run a pendulum at a set rate 
for a set amount of time, that's when we could actually start progressing with dividing our time even more. Now, where could this be useful? Believe it or not, it could be very useful in determining a ship's position at sea. Um, determining a ship's position at sea is always important. But when your voyages are, you know, near land or in a contained body of water like the Mediterranean Sea, figuring out where you are is fairly easy. You're going to use landmarks and water currents and your voyages just aren't going to be that long to begin with. As the sea voyages in the 1500s and 1600s became longer and ships ventured farther from bodies of land on a more regular basis, being able to determine where you are became harder and relied more and more on knowing precisely what time it was. Determining your latitude, how far north or south you were, well, that was fairly easy. As long as you're above the equator, you use the North Star. When you can see it, it happens that the Earth's North Pole points almost directly to where there's a star in the sky. The height of the North Star above your horizon, that's your latitude. Okay, that's easy. What about longitude? How far east or west have you gone? It was a few hundred years before that could be accurately determined using clock equipment that could be easily reproduced and carried on ships. Think about it. Could you carry a pendulum on a ship? No. We needed ways that moved beyond pendulums to create a clock that could accurately keep time without using a swinging pendulum because your ship would mess that up. You would need this thing to be able to accurately reproduce time. Now, astronomy, navigation, and map making were keys to all of this, and they all centered around accurate timekeeping. In 1674, Great Britain's King Charles II appointed a royal commission to look into how his country could gain advantages over everybody else in navigation. And the commission recommended that an observatory be built, and it became known as the Royal Observatory at Greenwich. And in 1676, two clocks with 13-foot-long pendulums were installed at the Greenwich Observatory outside London, and these clocks were accurate to within 10 seconds over the course of a day. This dramatically increased astronomers' ability to make accurate observations. These clocks were later refigured with smaller pendulums, and so the 13-foot version does not exist anymore. You're seeing a picture of the shorter version. So the top part is more the, the original clock, but the bottom part is not a 13-foot long pendulum. That doesn't exist. But the first astronomer royal, Sir John Flamsteed, wanted to know if Earth's rotation was constant. Well, with his new clock he could show that the spinning of our planet was, in fact, constant, at least to the accuracy that his clock could show. Um, and we'll come back to that uh, aspect of the story in just a bit. But by the 1700s, navigators were using portable clocks driven by wound springs, not pendulums, that could accurately maintain Greenwich's time on board a ship. What you would do is you would take your clock to the Greenwich Observatory where you could see it and you could compare the, or set the clock for your ship to what the observatory had, bingo, as long as you could keep that clock running on your ship, you could always know what time it was in Greenwich. You would then take a look at where the sun was in the sky where you were, and then you could figure out your longitude from there. As the 1800s approached, clocks and pocket watches had become very common. But how do you set your clock or your pocket watch? Well, with a garden sundial, of course. Um, this one was commissioned for a park in Melbourne, Australia in 1862. Well, all right, great. So you've got your clock or your pocket watch. Well, what do you do for timekeeping when you travel? Well, when travel was by foot or by horse, the differences in your local time, that's negligible. Your travel time took so long that you couldn't tell the difference from one place to another using your watch or your clock, and you would just sort of keep resetting your clock along the way, and your, your time would be fine. But with the arrival of trains in the 1800s, they were moving faster and getting you quickly from one place to another faster than the horse could travel. This brought forth another problem which was differences in local time. Now, clocks in the 1800s were kept to, to local solar time. When the sun hit its highest point in the sky for a specific place, that was noon for that specific place. However, for every 15 degrees of east-west longitude, 
your local solar time decreases or increases by an hour compared to that place where you are. That means for each degree of longitude, your local solar time changes by four minutes. If there's a sundial that shows noon at Greenwich, at that time at noon at Greenwich, it's still 1140 a.m. on a sundial at Oxford. Across Great Britain from east to west, there's a 30-minute difference in local solar time. But, man, you know, practically speaking, if it's just you going from one place to another by walking or by horse or by carriage, no big deal. You just reset your clock or watch along the way. And, and then when you get to where you're going, you're not going fast enough to really perceive the difference in local solar-based time. But with the invention of the train, the differences in local time quickly became apparent and problems appeared that didn't have easy solutions. If you travel by train from one place to another, whose local solar time do you use for the train timetable? How do you know what time to show up at your station and pick up your train? How do you, what time do you tell someone to pick you up from the train station? This is a hard enough question for railroads in a small country like Great Britain, where every town adjusted its clocks to the local sundial. In North America, time from one side of the continent to the other spanned three and a half hours. Each town used local sundials to set their clocks, while each railroad had a different standardized time for their published timetables. The potential for confusion is evident very quickly. Now, to solve this, after much discussion, debate, and consideration, the Earth was eventually divided into 24 time zones. How did we get there? Well, the starting point um, was based on the meridian defined by specific observatories that made noonday observations. This was initially done individually by country. In England, the time was taken in Greenwich. France used the observatory in Paris. The U.S. used the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. And as telegraphs began to circle the globe, it became possible to transmit time signals. In 1833, the Greenwich Observatory installed a bright red time ball mounted to a mast on the roof. The ball dropped pr at precisely 1 p.m. Greenwich time every day. And this allowed any ships that were on the Thames to observe the ball drop and set their chronometers in reference to the observatory clock. What does this sound like? The ball dropping in Times Square, right? So that's kind of where that idea came from, if I'm not mistaken. By the 1870s, daily time signals are being sent across England so that everyone could set their time to Greenwich. You didn't have to be sitting on a ship on the River Thames to be able to see this time ball. Um, you could do it using an electronic signal sent by telegraph. Now, the U.S. Naval Observatory sent occasional time signals beginning as early as 1865. By 1869, the Allegheny Observatory near Pittsburgh now, this is the U.S. Naval Observatory, by the way, but the Allegheny Observatory near Pittsburgh began a time service for an area spanning New York, Chicago, and beyond. The signal was sent to railroads and jewelry stores. You're thinking jewelry stores. I was not expecting Michelle to say jewelry stores. Jewelers placed clocks connected to these observatory time signals in their windows where customers could set their watches. Observatories charged fees to distribute their time services and these fees paid for astronomical research. Time literally was money. But the next step was how to unify timekeeping across the continent and across the oceans. Travel was becoming a continent-wide affair and a worldwide affair. Sailing by steamship was getting faster. Travel by train was getting faster. On October 11th, 1883, standard time zones in the United States were adopted at the Grand Pacific Hotel, which is located near LaSalle Street and Jackson Street in Chicago. Because over 100 local times were in use in the U.S. at that time, the railroads were the ones who came together for the General Time Convention to fix the problem. On November 18, 1883, this became the day of two noons when the Allegheny Observatory transmitted a signal when it was exactly noon on the 90th meridian, which is a little west of Chicago, runs through western Illinois. The railroad clocks were set from that. And then each one, each, uh, each, there were four time zones within the United States. Now, while this was a railroad convention, the time zones came into use in everyday life almost immediately. Everyone said, yeah, that's a really good idea. So we're going to start using that. Um, so this plaque that, I, that I've got a picture of um, 
is down at the location of the uh, where the Grand Pacific Hotel was located there near Jackson and LaSalle in Chicago. And you can see this plaque on the wall. It's outside. But just providing timekeeping in one country wasn't quite enough. In 1884, delegates from around the world gathered in Washington, D.C. for the International Meridian Conference to determine a common zero of longitude. Each of 24 time zones would be determined from one prime meridian and standardized to the average solar time within each time zone. And these were some of the delegates of that. Uh, International Meridian Conference. And the meridian of the Greenwich Observatory was chosen as the zero, zero point, mainly because it had a long history of timekeeping and because Great Britain still dominated world maritime commerce. France was not pleased. The French insisted that the prime meridian be in a neutral location and not tied to any one nation. Basically, they just didn't want the British to have a leg up and have the prime meridian run through its country. Um, and so French clocks they were so upset at this. French clocks still continued to use time issued from the Paris Observatory and remained nine minutes, 21 seconds ahead of Greenwich Mean Time from 1884 until March 10th, 1911. The French definitely held a little bit of a grudge, but they finally came around. And they're like, all right, close enough. We're going to finally get in line with the rest of the world. We still use these time zones today, um, though due to local geography, country borders, and various other reasons, the time zones have differing widths and edges. Some parts of the world even use half-hour offset time zones. The entire country of China is in one single time zone where the same span of land might normally cover up to four time zones, as it does here. Think about how crazy that might sound where sunrise is happening so the, the entire country of china everybody has the same clock time sunrise is occurring at a certain time in the eastern end of the country the western end of the country sunrise isn't happening for another four hours so anyway um but it works for china so that's a potential why they use that particular system now in the early 1900s the second was formally identified, not just by the swinging of Christian Huygens' uh, pendulum or, or, uh, uh, or the French mathematician who defined the second. The second was formally defined scientifically as a, f uh, a particular fraction of the average solar day, 186,400th of the average solar day which is the average period of rotation of the Earth on its axis relative to the sun. In the mid-20th century, this definition became inadequate because of the need for even more precision in timekeeping and scientific measurement. Earth's rotation is not constant. It changes due to a variety of factors. The moon's pull on the Earth, climate change, causing ice melt and rearrangement of the, the ice and then water mass on the Earth's surface. Ever important observations in tinier and tinier amounts necessitates more and more advanced and precise clocks. The second was redefined according to the length of a year and officially became the fraction. I need to read this off because there's no other way I'm going to remember it. One. 31,556,925.9747 of the year 1900. Even that definition would not endure for long. Atomic clocks were invented in the 1950s, and they give us the definition of the second that we have now. Pictured here is the atomic clock that currently defines the second in the United States. If you're wondering what the second is, I'm going to read it off to you. It may not make sense. It's okay. The second is the international system of units, unit of time measurement. One second is the time that elapses during 9,192,631,770 cycles of the light radiation produced by the transition uh, between uh, two electron levels of the cesium-133 atom. Okay, it's all right. If that just confused everybody and melted brain cells, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Basically, we've got a really precise way of measuring time, and it's based on uh, observing precise cycles of light uh, of a particular type of atom. And even that isn't enough. Is this 
uh, or the atomic clock I showed you? Is that the end all be all of clocks? At the, are we at the end of the line for measuring the second and defining time? And the answer is no. Work continues on a future clock like this one using other atoms that would even more precisely define the second. Something you think you know so well is something that continues to inspire astronomical and scientific research. So if you thought you didn't have enough time, <laughs> now you know why. So, all right, throw your questions in the chat. Um, I see that I've got at least one. So give me just a second. I'm going to go grab that. If you wanted to travel in Illinois for the April 2024 eclipse, what would be a good place to plan to watch it? Well, um, here, actually, let me show you a website called Time and Date. So give me a second. I'll share my screen and show you this, and I'll show you where to get this info. All right. All right. Here is, there we go. Okay, timeanddate.com. And you want to go to the sun and moon drop down menu. Go down to eclipses. All right. So you want to go to, let's see. You want to go to the list of all eclipses and planet transits, 1900 to 2199. And here we go, April 8th, 2024. Click that. All right. Is this total solar eclipse visible in Aurora? That's where I am. So it's registering where I am. Um, if you are watching this from Bloomingdale, when you go to this website, it will probably register that you are in Bloomingdale. So is this total solar eclipse visible in Aurora or Bloomingdale? The answer is not quite. I mean, the eclipse is visible, but not totality. Um, so you want to go to the eclipse map. You just want to get yourself to the eclipse map. Here you go. So Aurora, we're going to see almost a total solar eclipse, but not quite. Almost is not total. Um, so anywhere in this red path, that's where totality will be visible. So what area will see this eclipse? Um, if you go to, hang on. How about... Carbondale, Illinois, yet again, they're going to see just like they saw it in 2017, they're going to see um, the eclipse, but anywhere that you see this red path, um, you can click on here and, um, and get the, uh, the, the timing for the eclipse for that particular location. So Indianapolis, um, will see totality again, it all depends on the weather. I mean, the eclipse is going to happen. Whether you see it or not is going to depend on the weather. Um, but if you want to go to someplace in Illinois, southern Illinois, um, in this path, so you can pick out your, your best spot to pull over on the side of the road and, uh, and check out the eclipse. There you go. All right. What is before zero time? There is no time before zero time. So... Um, I think you uh, you might be talking about uh, what is before uh, the start of time, the start of the universe itself. We have absolutely no idea. We have no idea what what was prior to the universe. We have no idea what was prior to the start of the time we have in this particular universe. So there is no way to answer that question, which is kind of a cool way to answer that question. <laughs> All right, if anybody else has any questions or comments, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, I know the first thing that comes to my mind is we just had a time change this weekend. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Um, that started, I mean, my, my uninformed brain, because I haven't looked this up, <laughs> I'm gonna ask the expert, is that it actually started in what, the 1800s? Or 1900s? Uh, I believe the 1900s, I think. Um, they were um, wanting to save energy, especially during uh, World War II, wanting to save energy at night. Um, so they uh, instituted daylight saving time so that we weren't burning as much electricity at night. Um, 
So basically all you're doing is you're taking the, the, the daylight hours, you're shifting your clock, which means you're just shifting when the, um, uh, when the, when the time of sunrise and sunset occurs, it's still the same time, the same block of time, but you're just shifting it kind of like on a number line. Um, and so the, we still use it and I get, I get cringy every time people say, oh, we should just stay at daylight saving time. And I say, okay, everybody be careful what you wish for, because sure, sunset would be at 830 in the summertime, which it is now during daylight saving time. The problem, okay, sure, sunset in the wintertime would be at 5.30 p.m. Okay, that's cool. Sunrise in the wintertime would be uh, in the Chicago area, if I'm not mistaken, around 8.15 a.m., 8.30. Farther west in, in the central time zone, we're near the eastern side of the central time zone. Farther west at the edge of the central, at the western edge of the central time zone, sunrise wouldn't be until after nine o'clock in the morning, local time. So while everybody's going, no, we get more hours of evening daylight. Yeah, but you're go you are literally, you are going to work in pitch black. You are sending kids to school in absolute darkness. And so that's why I tell people, be careful what you wish for. And so that's why I wish we'd just stay on standard time personally. Um, that That's what I would hope. Um, but th the best thing to, to, to keep an eye on is um, uh, if you, if you want to see what the, what the range is of, of, uh, of those sunrise, sunrise and sunset times, don't, yeah, don't just all take it from the, from where we are. Cause we're in a, kind of a privileged location at the at the eastern end of the time zone so well, uh yeah it's a it, it can be pretty drastic if we if we stuck with uh daylight time and that makes so much sense because um i went to grad school in hawaii and they don't observe daylight savings time in hawaii but hawaii is not as big a spot place <laughs> yeah so that makes a lot of sense why they don't do yeah. that there um, let's see, question came up. When did scientists first become aware of time distortions, like how time passes differently in a spaceship than on the surface of the earth? You can, you can thank, uh, Albert Einstein for that. So figuring out some of those mathematical equations, um, Albert Einstein and other scientists at that time. So more like, um, kind of the early to, uh, mid ish, uh, 20th century, where we realized that traveling closer to the speed of light, um, meant that time functioned differently for an observer versus the person traveling. So um, at our everyday speeds like this, nobody really notices. Um, but massive objects like the earth, like the sun, cause time to operate slightly differently depending on how close you are to the mass or not. Our GPS satellites use this our phones, your GPS locator would not function if we didn't take um, uh, this this concept of time and and uh, uh, mass gravity causing time distortion. Um, if it didn't do that, then we wouldn't be finding our location using our phones. Our GPS satellites absolutely work like this. So, um, which is pretty amazing to think about. Uh, something you don't even think about every day, but yeah, the the early to early mid ish twentieth century is is when that uh, came about. Um, I think there's a question in the Q and A. Oh, thank you, thank you, Robert. Um, had a very nice, had a very nice comment. So, all right, more questions, everyone. Bring it on. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll ask another question while yes, people please. get their their fingers typing. Um, so I love that you brought up the earliest um, calendars um, from you know the ancient world. Um, and I remember studying in um, when I was getting my anthropology degree that uh, bones were often used for divination. But I'd never seen a piece of bone before that had the moon phases on it. And so I heard you just briefly say that that was a topic you're really interested in. Is there anything else that you wanted to 
elaborate on as far as like people tracking um, time or moon phases or sun phases um, that way in the ancient world? Yeah. And I find it fascinating because we tend to think as a calendar being a, uh, a very recent um, creation and it's not these people were counting they were planning they were doing math they were uh, thinking ahead into the future and the past and so this these are very abstract concepts and we don't often give people that credit where tens of thousands of years ago that they absolutely were capable of doing this um, I also find it interesting that um, based on um, what the various important books of various religions say, then you've got calendars that take the moon phases into account, but they're utilized slightly differently, such as um, uh, in the Jewish calendar, there is a, a, a 13th month lunar cal- lunar month reset added every about three years um, in the calendar to keep this, the, the, the uh, series of holidays and everything correct and keep the 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 calendar correct whereas in the islamic calendar there isn't that kind of a reset and it's it's based on interpretation of the various important works and and what it says about those so um as to whether or not you would do that so uh like in the jewish calendar if you didn't have that reset, then the uh, the holiday of Sukkot, which is a harvest time festival or harvest time holiday, you don't want that occurring in the spring. <laughs> and eventually it would come around to be doing that if you didn't have that calendar reset. Um, so it's it's fascinating to me um, based on based on that. Um, but it also makes total sense to me. Uh, and I never thought about it until looking into these early drawings of calendars and observations of the moon and all that, of course it makes total sense that they would look at the moon because there is a clear visible difference from one day to the next, depending on if you see the moon in the daytime or the evening. I love the question that Stan just put, did Stonehenge serve a calendar function? It may have been a calendar function of stone or sorry, calendar may have been a function of Stonehenge. It probably wasn't the only function of Stonehenge. Stonehenge is an extraordinarily complex site. There are lots of different areas in that whole landscape that are around there. And Stonehenge, yes, if you stand in the middle of the stone circle, there is an alignment with the summer solstice sunrise or if you stand on the outside of Stonehenge in a certain direction, it aligns with the winter solstice. So the winter solstice was incredibly important to people in the entire British Isles, uh, what we currently would call the British Isles. Um, Lots of stone circles and monuments and other things were set to the winter solstice. And that was when you might have certain um, holidays, feast days, parties, festivals, and all that. But it is, it's becoming more and more obvious that Stonehenge was a year-round site. It was not just stand in the middle of the circle and know when it's sunrise on the summer solstice. It makes no sense if you, if you really think long and hard, why would they spend that much effort and that much time dragging stones that weigh tons and tons and tons and tons from hundreds of miles away and put them there? to use on one day of the year. It doesn't make sense. And so when you think of it more as a uh, place of the living, celebrating the people of the dead um, and all sorts of things going on in certain areas nearby, it becomes a living site. And that's, I, I personally find that incredibly interesting because we we tend to dumb down the view of Stonehenge by thinking, oh yeah, well, they just all stood there in the middle on the summer solstice sunrise, sunrise and then went away. No, they were using this site and sites around it all year long. Um, and so, yeah, that's, it's something that, again, we don't give ancient folks enough credit for, uh, for the amount of effort that they took and planning and, and community effort to make a place like that happen and, and continue to function. So 
uh, Ed says Machu Picchu um, uses the sun shining through a window to know when spring started. So, um, so it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a portal that, uh, that the sun shines through, it shines on a particular rock. And I believe it's for the winter, I think it's the winter solstice, I think for that location, I think, um, but again, that's a that was a living site. It wasn't just used one day out of the year either. So um, definitely a great example of that. So, um, oh, <laughs> I mentioned the variation in length for months serves to reset the lunar and solar calendars to each other. But why is February the only significantly short month? One main problem is we've got a hodgepodge. I didn't even get into the the naming of months and all that. Um, we have such a hodgepodge that's come down over the over the eons as to how our calendar was put together. You've got the case of the month of July. Um, the month of July is for Julius. Caesar. The month of August is for Augustus Caesar. Why do both the months of July and August have 31 days? Because Julius wanted his month to have as many days as Augustus had for his. That's it. <laughs> so, but then you've got the num these number of months and they don't line up with the with the solar calendar. You can't divide 365 evenly so you, you're gonna have to take some days from other days and if you want to get or some days from other months and if you want to really get into crazy sounding calendars look into the roman calendar um it's it's a lot more complex than i'm than i'm getting into and i don't totally understand all of it myself either so um yeah so we currently have a hodgepodge of different ways that months were figured out and, and hooked together and fit together. And sometimes a month was longer than another one. This guy wanted his month named after him. And, and so he took from over here and stuck it over there. And so, yeah, that's kind of it. Um, let's see. What are some good resources to learn more about calendars and time? I'm a gardener and solar and lunar cycles are important for planting. That's a great question. I would put that back onto uh, the Bloomingdale Library reference folks if you can find some awesome uh, resources related to that. Um, I, I actually found the time and date website is kind of interesting um, just for an overview of certain ways of uh, defining time. Um, but there are a lot of websites out there that are about calendars or navigation or uh, the, the, the uh, Greenwich Observatory site is great. Um, the Smithsonian has articles on, uh, on time and calendars. So there's a whole lot of places you can go to. You can, you can look up time, calendar development, pick a culture, and I guarantee there's a website that, that's about it. So yeah. Um, yeah. As far as gardening, I would just um, interject that the Farmer's Almanac does talk a lot about those, you know, particular seasons. So I would go online um, and check the Farmer's Almanac. Um, and then this is a good segue because in the Q&A, we have a question from John. What is the address for the eclipse again? So I think he's ah, talking about yes. what website to go to. Yes. So it's I will put it in the chat. Give me just a second. And I will actually give you the link directly for the map for April 8th, 2024. Give me just a second. I'm just gonna check and make sure I've got the link correct. There we go, here. Here you go, everybody. I just put it in the chat. So that's the link to the April 8th, 2024 eclipse. Um, there we go. Oh, why are there 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute? Um, you can thank the Babylonians for that. Um, so dividing um, dividing a circle into 360 parts um, and uh, uh, those sorts of divisions came from the Babylonians. So 
uh, dividing a circle into degrees and degrees into smaller segments and, and those smaller segments into, into ever smaller segments as well. So even though the Babylonians were, I can't remember which one was first, the Egyptians or the Babylonians, anyway, around-ish the same time. Um, so yeah, we have a little bit of from this one and a little bit from that culture uh, and they all fit together that way. I love it. It makes me want to go to uh, the museum, the Oriental Institute, and <laughs> go see if they have anything on display about timekeeping in the ancient that's, world. Yeah, that's a great question. That is a hidden gem in Chicago. So if you've yes. not been to the Oriental Institute there on the campus of the University of Chicago, definitely go visit. They have they have an incredible um, uh, ancient cultures uh, uh, set of galleries. Um, so yeah, definitely go check that out. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I just want to remind everybody who's still with us that Michelle is going to be back on September 18 to talk about the upcoming eclipse says the one in October, the half and the one in April. So that's the great North American eclipse, September 18. And then she'll be back on Monday, October 23rd for 12 things that make life on earth possible. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And thank you, everyone who have been sending me uh, comments. I really appreciate it. And I hope you enjoyed this. And I hope this was a good use of your time. And so I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.